welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. I know you've seen the stunning photos of the spill in Colorado. We will give you the real story behind the spill. But first, we'll begin with another frightening story. Japan to restart mothballed nuclear reactors. And we'll take it from the newly controversial FukushimaUpdate.com as TEPCO officials face criminal charges over the lack of preparedness with regard to Fukushima and the IAEA report assigning considerable blame to the Japanese culture of overcompetence, overconfidence rather, and complacency, Bloomberg now reports Japan is about to do something that's never been done before, restart a fleet of mothballed nuclear reactors. The first reactor to meet new safety standards could come online as early as next week. Japan is reviving its nuclear industry four years after all its plants were shut for safety checks following the earthquake and tsunami that wrecked the Fukushima Daiichi station north of Tokyo, causing radiation leaks that forced the evacuation of at least 160,000 people. Mothballed reactors have been turned back on in other parts of the world, though not on this scale. 25 of Japan's 43 reactors have applied for restart permits. One lesson learned elsewhere is that the process rarely goes smoothly. Of 14 reactors that resumed operations after four years online, all of them had emergency shutdowns and technical failures, according to data from the World Nuclear Association and Industry Group. So more on that. Sweden closed a unit in 1992 and restarted it in 1996. It had six emergency shutdowns in the following year and a refueling that should have taken 38 days that lasted over four months after cracks were found in the equipment. James, what do we do about this? What do we do instead, if that's possible? Well, why don't I just snap my fingers and solve world hunger and <laughs> end poverty as well? Um, well, there is no easy answer to that question, because as people know, I'm sure, Japan is not a country that is rich in natural energy resources. No coal, no gas, it's all imported. So, I mean, it is a, a tough situation, but I think something that the last four years has shown is the lie that Japan requires nuclear energy to continue. Uh, Japan has continued. The lights are still on. So uh, there's there are ways around it, uh, maybe not economically sustainable ways, but still there are ways around it. But I, 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 I mean, just let's not completely dismiss the question. There are answers to it. I mean, there's there's geothermal power. I think an estimated 20,000 megawatts of ge geothermal power in Japan, of which they are currently only producing about 530, 537 maybe. So that's uh, there's an awful lot uh, of uh, possibility there. And of course, with uh, various new tidal uh, power generated generation techniques coming online and being tested right now, there's still a vast amount of potential to be tapped there. So there are there are some uh, ways of mitigating this uh, that are coming online. But uh, yes, I mean, the, the problem of Fukushima and the nuclear meltdowns and melt-throughs should not be taken lightly and should not be dismissed from this. Just because it is economically difficult to imagine Japan going off of nuclear power does not mean that it should not be done for a variety of reasons. And just to update the story, I believe the Sendai nuclear power plant is now, um, ha has just already started its re uh, restart. So it is actually uh, uh, going online and uh, on, on the way to being uh, fully operational. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that and see what develops as that article notes these reactors after four years of inoperation tend to have a lot of problems and emergency shutdowns so we'll see what uh, what comes of this well i was hoping that was going to be the one we'd have on the record before before the events actually happen but they the world moves quickly and it's and it's already starting to roll but i'm glad we're, we're getting this kind of on the record uh, again so james our second story this week is i th i think relates well in a way to our first story and I, I'd like to give it another angle. As the Navajo Nation vows to hold the EPA accountable for that Colorado spill, and we'll take this via Zero Hedge, having admitted responsibility for the poisoning of Colorado's Animus River, Mining.com reports the EPA, that's the Environmental Protection Agency here in the States, has now been forced to admit there was 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater, triple their previous estimates. While EPA leadership held a press conference taking responsibility, it appears they are now pointing the blame finger, or as we like to say here in the States, throwing under the bus their contractor, who they're now choosing to identify as the Missouri-based Environmental Restoration LLC. 
Lucky for them, for the LLC, which is one of the largest EPA emergency cleanup contractors. It's the main provider for the EPA's emergency cleanup and rapid response need in the region that covers Colorado, as well as several other parts of the country. They were awarded $381 million in federal contracts since 2007. And as the river slowly returns to normal on the surface, and that's both literal and and figurative, the Navajo Nation, with many residents along the river, declared a state of emergency this week, vowing to hold the EPA fully responsible for its spill and have demanded that the EPA provide the affected tribes with water until the river is once again usable. So let's just give the brief backstory as if you didn't see some of these stunning photos over the past week. The EPA said that about 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater, triple their previous estimates, poured from an old Colorado gold mine into local streams. It's been happening since last week. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency said this past Sunday the spill caused accidentally by one of its cleanup teams working at an old Colorado gold mine. The leak, containing high concentrations of heavy metals such as arsenic, mercury, lead, copper, and more, is now estimated to have reached about 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater. According to the first statement released by the EPA, the contaminated water was hiding out behind debris near the Gold King Mine entrance where the crew was working with heavy machinery. The mine waste poured out into a nearby creek, eventually leading to the Animas River, where the spill spread, and the spill will continue to spread, and of course it will reach larger areas and start to affect other people's drinking water, but we'll leave that aside for another time. James, perhaps even more damning and and fascinating, another story from Zero Hedge asking the musical question, did the EPA intentionally poison the Animus River to secure that good Superfund money? So a week before this disastrous leak, A letter to the editor in a newspaper, the Silverton Standard in Colorado, authored by a retired geologist, said how the EPA would screw up the Animus River on purpose to secure Superfund money. In part, he said, quote, but make no mistake, within seven days, and again, this is pre-spill, but make no mistake, within seven days, all of the 500 gallons per minute will flow, flow will return to the Cement Creek. Contamination may actually increase. This grand experiment, in my opinion, will fail. And then what will the EPA say? Gee, plan A didn't work, so I guess we'll have to build a treatment plant at a cost of 100 to $500 million. Reading between the lines, I believe that has been EPA's plan all along. End quote from an op-ed written by a guy who would know. So I think, James, as Zero Hedge actually said before, The EPA actually has no concern for the environment. They use the environment as a cover to create laws and gain advantage for the companies that lobby for exemptions to the agency's regulations and collect that money in fines. Now, positive solution note, there are solutions, but that's why they're kind of occulted in some ways. There are solutions outside the common government paradigm, and that's mainly the ability for individuals, not governments, to hold polluters personally and financially accountable. James? Yes, imagine a system like that, where people who polluted could actually be held accountable, as opposed to the system where the EPA is this nebulous government body that people go through. So hats off to the Navajo for trying to do something about this, but the fundamental solution isn't going to come from suing some government agency, because in the end, even if the government loses and has to pay millions in reparations, what does that mean? If your agency is funded at the barrel of a gun of government force and violence, well, all you're doing is stealing money from from everyone else to give to the people that were affected by this. So that's not obviously the ideal solution. And obviously any system where there is no possibility of accountability, how can the EPA possibly really held be held accountable for this? All that can happen is they get more money and more power to make sure it doesn't happen again. And who gets all of that money and, and power? It's the contractors that, that screwed it up in the first place. They just get more contract money to, to build the, you know, the, the water reclamation plant or whatever comes of this. So it it is a fundamentally unsound system as events like this show. And I'm glad it was such a, a visual thing that people can see. This is the Environmental Protection Agency. Oh, what would we do without the governments protecting the rivers? Well, this river wouldn't be yellow and full, filled with all that toxic garbage, for one. So, uh, so yes, I mean, stories like this are important to keep in mind that uh, government agencies and monopoly on violence to try to secure the protection of anything, the environment or anything else, is not the way, the best way to organize our society. We can do better here in the 21st century, and we have to if we want to continue living on a clean and healthy planet. 
James, I think our third and final story this week, as we've been doing good news stories throughout all of 2015, and we exhort people to submit good news stories, we need good solutions, positive oriented news, and you can do that using hashtag good news next week, and it's a perfect segue, James. Indian rapper overwhelmed by the success of her protest song against Unilever. We'll grab this from The Guardian. A rapper whose protest song about the corporate pollution in an idyllic hill town in southern India has dragged the issue into the spotlight. She says she's totally overwhelmed by the phenomenal success, which even prompted a personal response from the CEO of Unilever, Sophia Ashraf. She has a a song. You could call it a skit. It's a parody song. They kind of build off of the previous pop song. Kodai Canal won't. And Kodai is named is the tourist resort town in the hills of Tamil, the Nadu state that was contaminated by mercury from a thermometer factory. And it's been viewed at least two million plus times on YouTube. So it's kind of a parody of the Nicki Minaj song Anaconda. And she kind of talks about I wanted to use a dumb pop song that would grab the most amount of people who'd go, oh, I know that song. <laughs> so it's about the, the contamination. And the video features the 28-year-old Sophia Ashraf, once known as the Burka rapper. She's dancing on a boat and on a train while demanding that Unilever clean up its toxic shit. The factory at Kodai Canal, which was owned by Hindustan Unilever, closed in 2001. More than 1,000 former workers are alleged to have been affected by mercury poisoning, which can cause skin problems, sensory impairment, and a lack of coordination. So, James, this is the those kind of positive notes that that spread that can go virally so much like you can kind of see those photos and you have a response i think music can kind of give that same response james it absolutely can it's good to see stories like this to remind us that uh, sometimes keeping it simple and keeping it fun can make it some can can get awareness out on issues in ways that dry documentary style delivery like what i tend to do cannot do so uh, my hats off to people doing this and a little thing in this story that i found particularly interesting is the fact that apparently this uh, this rapper used to work at the advertising agency Ogilvy and Mather which people might remember a few weeks ago i covered uh, the the hong kong a uh, campaign that they came up with where they took pieces of garbage off the street uh, litter and tested it for DNA and created uh, f- photographic images of what the person who'd left it probably looked like. This creepy Orwellian campaign, that kind of thing that Ogilvy and Mather is into. But one of their workers is taking um, the, the sort of tricks of the trade that she learned and using it towards something actually worthy. So I liked that, the idea of turning these tricks around on, on these people and, uh, and using it to create a very large buzz around uh, a company that uh, does not want to see this uh, this type of attention. So, it's a good story. It's uh, and it's just another sign that truth music is just another effective way of getting an effective message out there in a way that people will relate to. Yep. So let's get a couple of other good news related updates. And we mentioned this last week that uh, Nestle stock in India had dropped by twenty percent over this ongoing contaminated Maggie noodles scandal. Now India's government is actually suing Nestle in kind of an unprecedented move. So we'll continue to follow that. Ireland refuses to extradite a man to the U.S. because the prison system is too inhumane. And James, you just had a nice uh, success. Hashtag winning. Ways that we are winning. And Scotland said no to GMO. So we'll include that link. And if you got a a brief word about your, your... that success. I, you know, I wanted to go into it further here just because I think I want to kind of share in the joy in, in some ways. Well, it is it is something that's good. And I think it's good because it represents the fact that people are are generally speaking opposed to the biotech agenda. And uh, and one of the uh, the commenters on my site raises the point, ban- uh, government bans are not the solution to this. And I agree completely. Government banning is not the ultimate end and solution to this. It has to be a, a grassroots movement of people rejecting the GMOs. That's the real victory but I think this shows that there is that uh, that animus amongst the public against the, uh, the, the 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 biotech giants so I'm writing about that in this weekend's forecaster I'll have a lot more to say about it there excellent and that's how we continue highlighting solutions based positive news that we've been doing all this all this year using hashtag good news next week we'll close out with some of the stories submitted to us by hashtag new world next week and these are stories that we've been following some of them developing and will continue to follow them china and russia each have major explosions within 24 hours of each other 
Gunmen attack the U.S. consulate in Turkey after an explosion kills three. We were kind of speaking about that last week, James, right here on Neural Next Week. You've got the Iran deal, the oil price plunge, currency wars, and the end of the petrodollar. You've got Kerry essentially intimating, well, you know, if it's, just, if it's, gonna, it's all going to go down and the dollar won't be the reserve currency. It won't be the dollar of the world anymore. So that is happening. Uh, Greek bailout terms to give Eurozone vast powers over policy making. You've got German public parks now turning into refugee camps as the Western Europe humanitarian crisis, if you can call it that, still kind of rages. In scenes reminiscent of the 2011 riots, police and paramedics attacked by a mob of hundreds in northeast London, and they continue to admit it uh, recently on Al Jazeera. U.S. ex-Intel chief mentions the rise of ISIS and said it was a, quote, willful decision. Meanwhile, predictive policing is the wave of the future, is the understatement from New York Commissioner. And Facebook tells the cops when you talk about criminal activity in your private messages. And the New York Times finally caught up with us here at New World Next Week, two and a half months later, as they are now warning in an op-ed, not an actual piece of investigative journalism, but warning about the Pentagon labeling journalists as unprivileged belligerents. We went over that back in June as we talked about the Pentagon's new Law of War manual and how chilling it was. James? Well, there you go. Sometimes the MSM catches up to us, and uh, that's why we are New World next week. So let's uh, keep our eyes on the prize and keep uh, bringing this information to people before it becomes international news. Anyway, thank you again for all these stories. Looking forward to doing it again next week. All right. Thanks, buddy.